Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, today's informational webinar will cover the basics of becoming organically certified, as accessing educational resources on transitioning to organic agriculture, and applying for organic cost share reimbursement. Uh, my name is Andrew Bernhardt. Uh, I am relatively new at the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection, or DATCAP for short. I help manage and promote DATCAP's Organic Certification Cost Share Program, OCCSP, and assist growers with accessing information on organic production, including becoming organic certified. Today's webinar will consist of three presenters, myself, Chuck from Moses and Kara from the USDA Farm Service Agency, FSA. Um, Chuck is an organic program specialist with the Midwest Organic Sustainable Education Service, or more commonly known as just Moses. Before joining Moses, Chuck was an organic inspector with, um, with MOSA, the certifier. And uh, currently Chuck and his family own and operate a small farm in Western Wisconsin. Secondly, after Chuck, uh, Kara will um, <clears throat> talk about organic cost share. Uh, Kara is an agriculture program specialist with the Wisconsin State FSA office here in Madison. For over six years, she has worked in the risk management division of FSA, providing training and technical assistance to county office staff on disaster and dairy programs. Today, um, I'm hoping to keep the presentations brief so that presenters have time to answer your questions. Um, and like I said, if you have any particular question, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or type in your question in the chat box. Chuck, I'll hand it off to you. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Um, thanks for inviting me to talk today. So uh, I'm going to... Let's see, I'm going to share my screen here, but ba basically what I'm going to do is just give a brief overview of what to expect with organic certification and kind of a overview of the process of like transitioning to organic and then share some um, some resources um, that are available to you as farmers around the Midwest and um, especially in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's kind of known um, nationwide as a kind of one of the cradles of organic agriculture so you're kind of in a great place um, for that so can you see my my slides here then yeah so this is um i uh, milk cows in the morning at an organic dairy farm nearby um and so one of the defining features of organic dairy is pasture um and so i just really like this picture as a panorama in the evening a few weeks ago so um yeah and so this is sort of a this is directly from the national organic standards um it's part of the law um it came into law in 2002 i think um, and this is the definition in the law of what organic means um so organic is is kind of special in the world of food marketing because there's an actual legal definition for it as opposed to natural or regenerative or sustainable or something like that um this is uh like a legal de definition you you can't use the word organic to describe what you're doing outside of these standards so it's um the organic community in the like 90s came together or 80s and 90s came together to uh, ensure that there was some unified um, definition for what it meant so that it couldn't be um, co-opted and um, watered down. Um, like I, re I remember once a few years ago, uh, Monsanto's website, when you opened it up, said, we are a sustainable agriculture company. So it's like, they can't do that with organic. <laughs> They're literally not allowed to do that. So um, one of the most important parts here is um, responding to site-specific conditions. Um, and so basically there's a lot of different ways to achieve the goals of organic, which is 
maintaining or improving soil organic matter and the natural resources of your operation while still uh, making a living farming. Um, and yeah, so built into the, the definition of organic is that it's specific to where you farm and how you farm. And then it's um, promoting ecological balance and conserving biodiversity are really in the definition itself of what organic production is. Um, so this is a basic overview of the process of getting uh, certified organic. So um, you can either transition the land. So if, if you or someone else before you were managing it and applied um, a prohibited chemical like uh, urea or glyphosate or something like that, then it's 36 months from the last application. Otherwise, like a lot of people will, um, you know, take a hay field or something uh, that hasn't had anything applied and um, and then be able to bring that right into organic production without that. Uh, so you don't have to manage it for three years. It just has to be verified that it's been three years since the last prohibited substance was applied. Um, second one, get in touch with your certifier. So that's that's good advice. Um, even before the year you're going to get um, get certified. So a big part of it is just that the certifier is really the only one who can give you permission to do something um, within the organic regulation. So if you call up me at Moses and talk to me, I can tell you um, what the rules are. Um, I can, and then I can like forward you on to one of our other specialists to help you with like production questions and things like that. But I can't actually say to you like, yeah, you're approved to use this. Um, so it's good to get in touch with the certifier early on in the process, start building that relationship, and then they kind of keep track of, of where you are in the process and we'll keep in communication with you and make sure you're on, on the right path. Um, and that won't cost you any money until the year that you get certified. Um, then you just pay for your certification. Um, and then you apply in the year that you wish to be certified. So uh, make sure you have enough time, enough like run up before you're going to want to sell organic crops. So, um, you know, if you're getting if you're getting certified for corn and that's your first fields you're going to do, then you just have to be certified before. Um, before you harvest it and and it has to be eligible before you harvest it um or sorry let me back up it has to be eligible for organic certification before you harvest it and you have to be certified before you can sell it um and then <clears throat> so you're you're going to want to give yourself at least 90 days before then so if you want to sell you know your first cutting of hay or something you want to get started earlier on or if you grow vegetables and you want to sell radishes or something in an early spring crop, then you just have to make sure you get the process started early on in the year. Um, so yeah, you send in an application and the application process is um, kind of long, um, but it, it really leads you through it step by step. Um, and there's, there's really, it, it might seem intimidating at first, but you just have to go through it and um, it just helps you describe how you're farming. So um, like I said in the last slide, it's like responding to site specific conditions. So there are tons and tons of ways to be an organic farmer. Um, and so this, the application materials basically just help, help them get the, um, get help the certifiers get the information from you that they need to verify that you're going to be eligible. Um, and then an inspector comes out during the growing season. And there's kind of two parts to an inspection. Um, the first probably is that they go over your paperwork with you. So they verify things like your seed receipts, um, input receipts, um, sales, and all that stuff like that. You take records of um, um, like field activities and things like that. I have another slide with a lot of the record keeping you're going to need to take care of. But basically the first part usually is that they go over all that stuff with you in your house or in your in an office or wherever. And then after that is they go out and walk your fields 
and look for, um, you know, they, they'll check your buffers to make sure there's no risk of contamination from neighboring fields. Um, they'll look for erosion, weed control, um, and plant health, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then after that, the inspector sends in the report and then somebody else from the, from the organization, the certifier reviews it, and then they'll either send you your certificate and say congratulations, or they'll send you a letter asking for more information. So sometimes that's, if you didn't have a seed receipt available at your inspection or something, they'll need to see that before they can issue your certificate. Um, and other parts of it is they'll, um, they might issue your certificate, but say like, you know, next year have this ready or next year make this change, that kind of thing. Um, and then it all um, happens again next year, the, the year after that. Um, the update paperwork is much shorter, much easier. Um, it's basically the more changes you make, the more work it is from there, there on out. But um, really the, the work is on the first year. Um, so this is kind of a visual of, of the process. Um, and this pointing out, you know, you're going to want to identify markets first. So, um, you know, it's, it takes a lot. It's a, it's a long process to get certified to transition land. And so you're going to want to make sure that you have, um, a, a viable market for the things that you're getting certified, you know, early on in the process. Um, like I said, 36 months of transition. Livestock is, um, for ruminant livestock for, for milk, it's a 12 month transition period. Um, for meat, um, for meat animals, it's basically the, the, the brood animal has to be uh, managed organically the last third of gestation. So a beef cow is three months of organic management of the, the brood cow. Um, and then the, um, the animals can be raised organically and sold as organic meat. Um, but you can't transition an animal into organic meat production. Um, chickens have to be managed organically from their second day of life. Um, so basically as soon as you get them in the mail, they have to be fed organic feed and managed organically um, until they start laying or until you send them to the butcher. So, and then, yeah, give yourself three to six months. Um, and then you just ongoing things, you maintain your records, keep everything up to date. Um, and then every year there's an inspection and every year, um, you'll get a letter from the certifier either saying, good job, here's your certificate, no concerns, or, um, you know, there was a little erosion in this field. Um, we'll check up on this next year you said this was your plan to deal with that at your inspection and we'll just follow up next year to make sure that um that you're doing what you can to stop that erosion from happening for example um these are just some of the record record keeping requirements um i'm not going to read off everything on the on the list but um basically you have to record um pretty much everything to do with your farming business. You have to have a record of it. Um, and, you know, I've, I've worked on a lot of farms before, uh, and the best farms, the best farmers that I worked for were certified organic. I worked for some that were like organic practice, but not certified. And I think part of it was that because they had to keep these records, it helped them to manage their farms better. So it, it's a positive thing um, to have to do, and it's kind of nice I've seen to have an external force making you to take all these records, because if you're just doing it on your own, you might not have all that motivation to do that. Um, but there's a lot of overlap between records that are required for organic certification and records that are um, beneficial for improving the management of your farm. Um, and then also financial records and all that stuff is also, there's a lot of overlap. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a, it helps you to be a better farmer to take um, good detailed records. Um, and it's kind of an external thing helping encouraging, encourage you to do that. Um, 
So some things to keep in mind about organic certification. Um, there's a steep learning curve right away the first year. Um, and there's the most work to do in the first year, like I mentioned. Um, but basically you just gotta um, fill out the paperwork, ask a lot of questions, develop relationships with the certifier. Um, and if you're missing anything, they'll just ask for it. It's not a big deal. Um, you can always um, take care of that if you miss it the first go around. Um, the certifier has, they'll have the sort of mentality of continuous improvement. They have that for themselves and they have that um, for you because it's, it's built into the standards, you know, maintain or improve soil organic matter, maintain or improve the natural resources of your operation. Um, and so, you know, they'll, they'll want to see that, um, that you're making adjustments as they are like reminding you of different standards as the inspectors look at different things on your farm every year. Um, most things are resolvable. So this is, this is a thing to just like ease your nerves a little bit because Sometimes people will get a letter that says notice of non-compliance and it's really scary or condition for continued certification and it's really scary. Um, they have to have that language because basically the certifiers are like writing legal documents essentially like if it goes through the process of um, like suspending or revoking a certificate there's a lot of um, recourse for the farmer to appeal that and stuff. And so basically what they write to you has to be this sort of like legally, it, it has to stand up that way. Um, but pretty much everything is resolvable except for things like fraud. Um, if you uh, spray your fields with glyphosate and don't tell them and then try to keep growing or something, those big things are not really resolvable. Um, but if you have a problem with erosion or if you forgot a bunch of records or if you lost a bunch of receipts or something like pretty much everything is resolvable and you just have to talk to them and, and develop that relationship. Um, and then why you're going to farm organically is really important. So, um, you know, if the people that I've seen that have you know, transition some fields just to get the high price of corn or something don't usually last that long um, in organic farming because it's really about the systems. It's really about um, a way of doing it that uh, has some like deeper meaning for people. Um, and and so, yeah, that that's something inspectors will ask a lot. It's like, why why did you want to go organic and, or something? And it's it's always an interesting conversation. Um, and then just some resources about Moses. So one of the things that you should know about going organic is that you're not alone in it. Like you might not have any neighbors in your direct vicinity who are organic or really understand what you're trying to do. Um, but there's ways to get plugged into that community. Um, one of them is, uh, the Moses farming organic farming conference. Um, it's the largest organic farming conference in the world, or not in the world, sorry, in America. Um, and it's a really unique time to meet people from all over the place that do all different kinds of, of production. Um, there's really good food. There's tons and tons of stuff to learn. Um, so yeah, visit the mosesorganic.org slash conference if you're interested. It's a, uh, I got to go a few times before I was on staff and it's just a great time. Um, and then we have field days and lots of other organizations do as well. And uh, if you go to our community calendar, you can see all that. They're pretty much wrapping up for the season, but um, we've also made a lot of video recaps from this year. Um, I think by the end, by the time I get it all done, there'll be video recaps for all of our field days, except for two. Um, one I couldn't go to because I was sick. Uh, and the other one I just didn't go to. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a it's a great time to meet people in your area interested in the same kind of production. Um, ask super practical questions of someone someone doing it. So, um, how am I doing on time, Andrew? You're doing great. Yeah. Um, okay. On average, 
uh, how many field days does Moses uh, hold in a year? Uh, yeah, so this last year, I think we had seven or eight. I can't remember. And they're kind of scattered around the Midwest. Um, we had one in Illinois, one in Missouri, one in Iowa, um, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, so yeah, scattered around a bit. Um, nice. and, and, and uh, quick, this is and a, quick... another one of our, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to make a quick plug for the, um, conference. Um, it, it's a fantastic place. Um, something around 4,000 people come to lacrosse from not just Wisconsin. It's, it's a, it's a big draw from lots of different states. And, uh, one thing that you, you was on your slide, but you didn't call out specific. I was going to make sure people know about it is that there are some scholarships that kind of help you get there. If, if you want to try to access that. Yep. Yeah. And it's a great time to, you know, if you're new to organic farming or transitioning, it's a great time to, um, you can kind of meet everyone that's involved in it there. Um, there's a huge trade show, so you can go meet any suppliers you might want to talk to. Um, you can get to know all the, the kind of the network of organizations that, um, support farmers in organic farming. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really incredible event. There's a little, there's less than 4,000, but <laughs> I think, uh, in 2020, it was like 2,600 or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's still, still quite a big event. Um, and so this is our, this is one of our interesting programs. It's called the organic answer line. Um, and so it, it's sort of like extension, but it's farmer to farmer. So, um, you know, extent, if you call extension, they can give you answers to things, um, based on the latest research and a lot of like super valuable experience. And this is just sort of a different flavor of that, where you can call up, um, Carmen Fernholtz, who's been doing certified organic grain since 1976 and talk to him about weed control and thistles or something. And he'll, it's based on his experience and the things he's learned over the years. So it's just kind of a different take on, um, on how to get support. Um, <clears throat> and that's available for pretty much all kinds of production here in the Midwest. And it's available in English, Spanish, Hmong, Swahili, and Somali. Um, and I can also assist with, uh, organic certification questions. Um, and that's either calling or emailing. Um, we have a mentorship program, so that's been really valuable for beginning farmers. It's also for people transitioning. So, uh, a couple years ago, we had someone in the program who had been a, uh, he had been doing no-till conventional row crop farming in Illinois for like 25 years and, but wanted a mentor to transition to organic. Um, and so that's, uh, basically we pair, uh, transitioning or beginning farmer with an experienced farmer in their production type in their area um, and kind of facilitate that building of a relationship and um, you know now it's been going on for 15 years now and now there are um, like areas of the Midwest where there's like the original mentor and then there's several farmers in the area who are mentored by that person and now they're starting to mentor the next generation of farmers. So it's, it's been a really, um, really valuable thing. And so you can, that's open to sign up for right now. There's also scholarships for that as well. Oh, and, and it includes, uh, admission to the conference, um, for two years. Um, and this is actually next weekend is new farmer. You it's, um, aimed at people in like third to fifth year farming or just people who want to focus more in on their um, farm business skills. So it's for any kind of um, production It's because it's really focused on farm business skills. Registration closes on Monday for that. There's there's scholarships available as well. So I think with the scholarship, the price goes down to 
fifteen dollars, I think. So um, get in touch if if you're curious about that. I think next year it's going to be in Wisconsin in partnership with the Wisconsin Farmers Union. So um, we have some podcasts. So in her boots is a, a really fantastic um, podcast hosted by Tiffany Lachey. And then I host the uh, Moses Organic Farming Conference, so a lot of what it's been is um, audio from previous conferences and um, field days and interviews and stuff like that. Um, so this is kind of an over overview. We have, in, in particular with organic certification, we have the Guidebook for Organic Certification, which is a really fantastic resource. It's free uh, either as a PDF or... Um, We'll send one to your house for free as well. Um, and then every two months, the Organic Broadcaster comes out, which is a newspaper about organic farming. And that's also for free, um, either in print or virtually. Um, and yeah, I think overall, your best resources as someone interested in organic farming, looking to transition or looking to improve your production is the really strong community of other farmers and the and the really great organizations in the Midwest that are here to support you. So Moses is just one of them, but whatever your production type, there's probably a really active community of farmers that are interested in helping you out. So, um, you know, if you're a grain farmer, there's O-Grain at UW-Madison and they have a listserv where farmers will just ask questions and then other farmers will will answer and help each other out. Um, if you're a vegetable farmer, there's the Fair Share CSA Coalition uh, um, listserv where they'll do the same, where it's just super supportive. Um, and generally, the general kind of like um, spirit of organic farmers is to share what they've learned with other people. Um, and sort of a spirit of cooperation and community building. Um, and so that's kind of like your number one thing, I think, is just getting connected with other farmers. And that's a big part of what Moses tries to do and what a lot of our other partner organizations do. Um, and then, like I said, there's just so many great organizations in Wisconsin, especially, but throughout the Midwest to support organic farmers. Um, and to sort of like guide you through the process. So you're not alone. Um, you don't have to try to figure out everything on your own. Um, and so if you, you know, if you call me up and we don't have the answer or the resource for it, um, my job is to connect you with someone who does, someone who can, you know, meet with you more one-on-one -on -one or come out to your farm, something like that. So, um, yeah, you're not alone, even if in your neighborhood it feels like it because there might not be any organic farmers nearby. Um, you can certainly get get in touch with other folks and get connected and um, and learn one on one from an experienced person and from the community. So. Um, and then we can either do questions now uh, if there's uh, questions about any of that um, or if you want to wait till the end, it, it doesn't matter to me if anyone has any questions, especially to clarify anything that I said. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my, my feel for now. So overall, the message is like, um, it's possible <laughs> to transition. It's, uh, it's, it might be intimidating, but just keep working at it. And, and there's people to help you along. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a welcoming and supportive community. So, thank you, Chuck. Feel free to unmute and ask any questions. Um, otherwise, uh, throw your question into the chat box, and we'll we'll get to that too. If there isn't any questions, I'll go I, ahead, Kim. I have a question. Yeah. Um, are there any templates for the records that need to be kept? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, not really. Um, <laughs> and people would ask that a lot, but like, basically, um, it's so specific to different people's farms and their record keeping styles that um, 
you know, there, there might be some things out there, but it, you know, it can be as simple as, so, you know, when I would go do inspections, sometimes there's just like literally a calendar that just had things written down on like a big calendar and things written down in each day, like what they did. Um, or a notebook and they would just put the date at the top and then write what they did and turn the page. Um, so it can be really simple and straightforward like that. Uh, yeah. And then there's also, you know, something like that all the way up to like apps that you can get um, on your phone. So one one example that one of the farmers that I worked for used is called COG Pro. I think COG stands for certified organic or something like that. Um, but that's kind of a, a record keeping tool um, I think there's uh, there's got to be other apps and different online stuff, but um, mm -hmm. basically it can be as simple as you want. Um, certifiers do have a lot of um, forms for more specific kinds of things. So uh, an example of that is there's um, one of the one of the standards is that you have to use organic seed unless organic seed is not commercially available and then you have to use untreated non-gmo seed and you have to um, have record that you did an organic seed search which is just you looked for organic seed um, but you couldn't find it in the quality variety or quantity that you were looking for um, and they have forms that are just like uh, they they just have spots for you to put all the information that they're looking for and so they'll have forms for those kinds of things um and and then you know put all those things together and you kind of have templates for each thing um another another sort of template is the um the organic system plan itself so for the most part the organic system plans are just uh, like questionnaires basically and you go through and answer questions about the way you farm and some of them are just like check boxes and some of them are like short answer things um, and so that's kind of like a template for um, the kind of questions that they'll ask you but as far as I know there I, I'm not aware of any like um, you know like record keeping books you can go out and buy or something like that but it it can really be as simple as uh, as you want it or as complex. Um, so, some people would send in, uh, you know, Excel spreadsheets with stuff or, yeah. So <laughs> let's say we're the simple type and we did the calendar format. Is it something that we're gonna show the inspector the calendar when they come out or do we take pictures and email yeah. it in or? Yeah, so, um, so basically the field records that kind of stuff you'll just show the inspector um and one thing that they do is a uh, crop audit and basically they'll pick one of your crops and they'll either go um like from sale backwards or from like seed forwards um and just s basically to do an audit of your record keeping system um so say you did corn or something then they'll they'll see where did where was it sold or where was it stored you have a record of that and then trace back to like when it was harvested um and how much was harvested um and then before that like the last um, field records you might have had like cultivations <clears throat> um and before that when you planted and before that when you uh, prepped the field um and before that, what seed you bought. Um, so basically it's just a system that can be um, audited in that way. And there's like many, many, many different ways to make that happen, but um, but yeah, so um, yeah, I th Andrew put some, put some rec um, record keeping resources in there. Um, <clears throat> but for the most part, you just have to find find a system that works for you and stick to it. Um, I think if I was going to be an organic farmer, that would be my struggle is just like sticking to the system I, I came up with <laughs> uh, and making sure to put that information in there. Um, but yeah, it, it can be, it can be real simple.
So, oh, sorry, one other clarifying question with the calendar. So let's say the date's already there. We just put something like weeded today or, or planted. Like it can literally be just like a few words of what was done on each day. Uh, yeah, you'd want the, um, the field to be specified. Um, so that part of the record keeping process is identifying specific fields. Um, yeah, we have a one acre how, farm, and, so it's for us okay. it's pretty simple. Yeah, yeah. And then there'll be like uh, a map too. And that can be anything from like a Google map thing or a um, FSA map or, you know, a lot of Amish people are certified organic. And so they just use hand-drawn maps. Um, so, so yeah, it just, it just has to basically be enough information to, um, that someone who, without you there to explain it to them could understand what it meant. Um, and again, if, you know, your first year you just have weeded and the certifier thinks that's not enough, they'll just tell you. And then next year you just change it a little bit, make it, give a little bit more information. Um, so it's, it, that's an example of one of those things where like everything's resolvable and it's about continuous improvement. So, you know, even if your record keeping system isn't quite enough, um, you can just learn as you go and update things and add stuff. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chuck. Tara. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Andrew said, uh, my name is Kara Klein. I'm with the Department of Agriculture um, Farm Service Agency, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the cost share reimbursement program that the Farm Service Agency has to reimburse the costs of some of your organic certifications. Um, so, uh, to be eligible for the reimbursement, um, you have to have paid certification fees. Um, the certification must be done by a USDA accredited certifying agent. Um, and it's on a first come first serve basis. So any applications received after um, all the, after we use all the money, uh, those will not be paid. So pretty, um, minimal requirements um, for this program. We do, there are only certain costs that are eligible for reimbursement and you can see them here, applications, inspections, um, travel for the inspectors, user fees, sales assessments, postage. Those are um, costs that are able to be reimbursed. Um, things that are not able to be reimbursed include equipment, materials, supplies, um, the fees for transitional, any late fees or any fines that you may have. Our maximum reimbursement is $500 per scope. And the four scopes that we work with here in Wisconsin are livestock, wild crops, uh, crops and handling. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so there are two ways to apply for uh, reimbursement. You can do that through DATCAP, which is the state agency that Andrew is going to talk about in a little bit about their process, or you can apply through FSA, um, which is the, organ the farm service agency, which I represent. Uh, the quickest way to find out if you are not familiar which farm service agency um, serves your county. We have offices in almost every county in Wisconsin. And if you go to farmers.gov, you can um, up at the top right hand corner, you will find a service center locator and you can click there and then it will um, show you the, the service centers in your area. We do have a, a standard form that you will need to complete to apply for reimbursement. When you are um, working with your local agency, your local farm service agency, you will need to bring along the proof of certification. Um, any invoices that you're going to put on this application that you want to be reimbursed for, 
Um, the AD, uh, I think I have a mistake there. Um, it is the uh, form for our wetlands compliance and then our form for direct deposits. And um, if you are an entity, we have a little bit more um, paperwork for you to fill out to um, say who has signing authority for your agent or for your entity. So when you contact the local service center to um, complete the application and the process, they will walk you through all of these forms that you will need. Um, this is a picture of what the form looks like. It's pretty, um, as government forms go, it's uh, relatively short. Uh, it's just the, um, your name and your address, um, who did the certification, their, um, their information, and then which scope you're applying for and how much you spent on each of those scopes. Um, the one thing to remember is that you cannot, uh, as I said, the, both the state and FSA has an organic reimbursement program or cost share, um, but you can, it's one or the other. You cannot apply for funding with both agencies. Um, and then uh, on the next page, you just sign it. And um, like I said, submit that to your local farm service agency and they will um, take care of it and get process your reimbursement. Um, it, will, it probably will take a couple of weeks to a month or so to get reimbursed, especially right now since we're in the midst of transitioning to a new fiscal year. Um, so that funds may or may not always be available because of that transition. Um, and so here you will see the deadlines. If you are wanting to come to FSA to apply um, for this program, the important date to remember is October 31st. So it's coming right up um, <clears throat> to complete your request for reimbursement um, through FSA. I think DATCAP has a different deadline and um, Andrew will talk about that. Um, but that's pretty much the program in a nutshell. Like I said, it is um, relatively uh, simple to get the reimbursement as long as you have the receipts. A couple things to note about the receipts that I forgot to mention is that they have to be marked paid. Um, we will not reimburse on a receipt that is not marked paid. Um, and that that's the big thing. So make sure you're bringing a paid receipt um, to the FSA office when um, requesting your reimbursement. So uh, I believe that is all I have unless people have questions. Remember our deadline is the 31st. Thanks, Karen. You're very welcome. I'll go ahead and get my, uh my screen shared here in a second. Let me stop sharing. How do I do that? Okay, there you go. Okay, are you seeing the correct presentation or the? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the differences uh, with DATCAT's uh, organic cost share program, but essentially they're the, the same. So this will be really brief. Um, just like with FSA, um, we need a few things to process your cost share reimbursement. The application, the questions are about exactly the same. The form looks almost identical. Uh, we need to see that certification letter that, that comes from your certifier. Um, this is something that 
a lot of times your certifier can send to DATCAP. Um, but this is also something that you can scan or photocopy and send to us in the mail or email. Then we need a proof of payment. So you are gonna have eligible expenses. Um, we need to see proof that you had those expenses. Those um, sometimes can be sent in um, from your certifier, uh, but you need to talk to your certifier and see if that's something they will do for you. Um, and for new applicants, we need to have you fill out a W-9 just so that we can send you that payment. The guidelines, um, they're the same as FSA. Um, and for 2021, just like Kara said, you can receive uh, up to 50% back of your total eligible costs uh, with a max of $500 per scope. So if you were certified for two different scopes, say crops and livestock, and you spent $2,000 or more in eligible expenses, you could get um, reimbursed for $1,000, uh, which is $500 for each scope. Um, in the past, uh, reimbursement rates were 75% up to $750. And um, I don't know what the future holds, but I think there is, um, that might go back to that rate. Um, but the amount that each state has to um, disperse and the deadlines and all that kind of stuff, that's all set by USDA and how much money is available at the national level. So um, deadline, uh, our deadline was October 31st, um, which that deadline is actually set by USDA. Um, but uh, we were able to apply for uh, an extension. So uh, we have a new deadline uh, for anyone that wants to submit their um, cost share reimbursement application materials. And that is December 1st. Um, you can access all those materials on our website um, and some information and there's links there. That's the URL. Um, and as Kara already pointed out, um, these funds uh, that we have, that Wisconsin has, uh, they're limited and it's on a first come first serve basis. So if you wait um, later because you have more time um, and we run out of money before that, even if you submit your uh, application um, before the deadline, we might not have money to reimburse you with. So uh, that is it for me. Um,